Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in. I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Adrian Simpson is a special guest on today's show. For over 20 years, he's really been immersing himself in amongst some of the top firms around the world, including the likes of Apple, Tesla, Netflix and Google. And we're going to dive into some of those leadership secrets. But before we do, it's the Leadership Hacker News. Purpose is a real key part of all leaders' capabilities, but often leaders get it wrong. Commonly, we see leaders think that purpose should be the same as their company's vision, mission, or purpose, but it shouldn't. Believe writing a leadership purpose statement is not a one-time exercise at all. It's something that should evolve and it should connect the individual to the purpose of the organization. It's incredibly important and it needs deep insight and deep thoughts. So what is leadership purpose? Your leadership purpose is your statement about who you are as a person and how you bring those unique qualities into your world. First and foremost, leadership purpose is about your values and what's important to life for you. It's often also considered as your why statement or your reason, your beliefs. Think about your leadership purpose statement as being your beacon, enabling people to have a real clear understanding of what your direction in life and work is. In doing so, it will help you drive the right behaviours on a daily basis and keep you engaged when circumstances around you can be challenging. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. Your leadership purpose statement must be a living and breathing document that you can share so others understand it too. And it will likely change as you change as a person or your career grows or changes shape. So you should always update it regularly. And remember, your leadership purpose will not only help keep you grounded and you stay on your path, it will help you be a better leader and the leader you're meant to be. Most important, it sets a declaration of the kind of support you're prepared to give as a leader for the people around you, so they can also buy into your journey. So simply put, think about the purpose, your why, and make sure it describes your values, your beliefs, and your vision, and how that aligns to the organisation that you work and serve with. That's been the Leadership Hacker News. Let's dive into the show. Adrian Simpson is the co-founder of Wavelength Leadership Group. For over 20 years, he's taken top leaders into the boardrooms and shop floors, some of the world's most successful, innovative and admired companies, including Alibaba, Netflix, Apple, Tesla, Lego, and Google, to name but a few. Adrian, welcome to the Leadership Hacker podcast. Thanks, Steve. It's uh, great to join you this morning. Really looking forward to diving into some of the lessons learned from some of these huge conglomerates. But tell us a little bit about you, your background, and how you've arrived to do what you've done. Gosh, so, um, yeah, so very, very brief uh, resume. Um, Started uh, my career in retail with John Lewis Partnership, Um, then decided at sort of age 21 to go off to university in Manchester, did a degree in, in business and marketing. And um, just after university, I managed to um, to, to, to uh, stumble into a role with the uh, incredible Tom Peters group. And for those that aren't old enough, Tom Peters uh, was certainly in the 1980s and 90s the most uh, successful management guru uh, of, of his time. Uh, his Jim Collins of his day, who, who wrote an amazing book called In Search of Excellence and sold many millions of copies. And um, to give us a sense, I was putting him on stage in the 1990s at about um, uh, 120,000 US dollars a day back in, back in those days. So, uh, incredible. Um, and then uh, one day, yeah, after being at the Tom Peters Group, where I was um, helping put him on stage and find some, he he really wrote about companies that had kind of amazing cultures that really just sort of got it. And and indeed, I'm still visiting some of the companies he wrote about 
goes about 30 years ago, like Southwest Airlines. Um, the phone rang and, and a small innovation company called What If was on the phone. And um, one thing led to the other and uh, a conversation snowballed into a coffee, a coffee into a lunch, a lunch into a come join us. And um, I moved into to join What If uh, for 11 years um, which was a, a when I joined, we were 10 people. When I left, there were 355 countries. And um, it was the ride of my life and and um had an incredible opportunity there to to provide our clients with some inspiration, started running sort of study tours, uh, events, and then 14 years ago made the jump to to co-found uh, co-found wavelength. So, so what is it uh, specifically that wavelength do? Um, our specialism is bringing the outside world in. Um, basically, we we scour the world um, looking for examples of practitioners um, who are what are the leaders, the organisations that have compelling stories to share with our clients, and really providing our clients with a combination of what I would call inspiration, education, and provocation. Um, and our hypothesis really is that the level at which we operate at is that leaders learn best from leaders. So, as I mentioned, sort of you know scouring the world looking for practice. Um, you know, have got real experience um, on topics that our clients are interested in, albeit, you know, I was literally in America uh, 10 days ago with a group of 20 leaders from all around the world. Um, uh, would they flew into, to, we had clients from Australia, from uh, India, from uh, Japan, from the Middle East, um, six across North America, the rest from across Europe, um, from lots of different organizations. Um, they flew into Dallas, Texas, on a Saturday, uh, we began on a Sunday morning with a sort of half-day workshop, and then for the first day and a half, we spent uh, going inside um, the legendary um, Southwest Airlines and Ritz Carlton, really focusing on excellence in in um, culture and leadership and service. And then we were in Silicon Valley for three and a half days, looking at innovation, disruption, new business models, what's next and what's next next, um, doing some set piece visits. Um, but also doing some incredible things like going for drives in in the world's first fully autonomous robot taxis operated by crews that have no drivers in them at all, <laughs> or doing uh, metaverse meetings in the metaverse uh, uh, using Oculus Quest headsets, or um, so some really productive stuff. So we do um, things like that. So you know, very very um, intense one week immersions for very senior business leaders. Um, we have at the other end of the spectrum, we have a, a digital only program called Inspire, which is every single month, um, typically on the third Thursday of the month, we take um, a cohort of leaders from lots of different client companies live inside a great business somewhere around the world of an audience with a really accomplished leader. Um, last week, we hosted a session with Alistair Campbell on mental health. In Next week, we have the former Prime Minister of Denmark, Helle Thorning Schmidt, on how to lead a country. We've got Jesper Broden coming up, IKEA's chief exec. We've hosted um, um, Alan Job, Unilever's chief exec. We've hosted, we're have we hosting uh, Tim Steiner, a Carter chief exec in September. And they are just reg- short, sharp, regular doses of live world-class inspiration for our clients. And we've got amazingly 700 people signed up to that program from around the world. Um, so we do, you know, whether it's digital only, short, sharp, live, um, inspiration whether it's week long or we have a, a other other programs one called connect which is sort of has about 50 people on it and is uk based and runs about nine months or whether it's just you know helping clients bring speakers in for a for a particular offsite or conference but but again that's any speakers we will use will will be practitioners how awesome so you managed to really bump shoulders with and as you said immerse other leaders with these great leaders from around the world what's the reason your focus is heavily aimed at making leaders learn from other leaders? I, I just think there is a, a relevancy that you cannot get and an applicability that you cannot get from any other kind of learning when it comes to leadership is, is, is in my view. Now, I'm not for a second saying there is not a role for you know academics and business schools and some kind of provocative, rigorous thinking. I think there is a role for that. But I suppose my best sort of um, summary when I had a chief exec who um, has been with me to he uh, a chap who, who was chief exec of a FTSE 100 company. He came with me to America for a week. He came with me to China for a week, and I said, you know, John, why why are you why are you doing these programs? And he said it was very simple, Asian. He said um, my previous HR leader he said kept on telling me to go to Harvard. 
And I kept on saying to her, tell me where I should go to business school to learn about business from someone who'd never run a business, and I'll go. He said, she didn't, so I didn't. <laughs> and I thought, and he said, so when, you know, she put in front of me the chance to spend a week in the US alongside peers from different industries, different sectors, learning from companies and leaders that were perhaps a bit further ahead of us in terms of their narrative, he said it was a compelling proposition because they know what it's like to sit in my seat. They know what it's like to sit as a board director with multiple stakeholders, internal and external, limited resources, having to make informed decisions. And he said, with the greatest respect, no academic, no guru, no consultant knows that reality unless they have also at some point run a major business. So I think it's that sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, r- real, real um, applicability. I think is is is, and it's just, and it's just, and I think it's, you know, what I've what I've learned as well is that you know, when you give clients the opportunity to hear from other leaders and learn from other leaders, you know, you can just, it's easier almost to swipe with glee if you like what it yeah. is that they've done. You know, um, I mean, I'll just give you an example. There was a. You know, I did. A, I actually did a, did a podcast myself with a tremendous guy called Fred Reed um, a couple of months back. And Fred was the founding chief exec of Virgin America. He was the president of Delta Airlines, the president of Lufthansa. He went on to work with five years of Brian Chesky at Airbnb, and he also did a stint with Larry Page at his private uh, company Kitty Hawk. So you know, he's worked with Richard Branson, Larry Page, um, you know, Brian Chesky, and also been a twice president and one time CEO. And I was talking to him about the challenge of, you know, communication and how do you as a leader, you know, build an understanding in the business of what business you're in and operational realities. And he told this fantastic story about when he was both at Lufthansa and Delta. Faced with that challenge, he decided to create a game and um, a board game. And um, basically what he did was he would invite um, uh, cross-sections, cohorts of leaders from across the business, whether it's um, air stewardesses, pilots, mechanics, ramp agent, didn't matter. And they would be invited to take a day out, fully paid, to play this board game. But what the board game was full of was real operational data and decisions. And in sort of teams of eight, they had to like make a decision Are you going to give people a 3% pay rise? Are you going to buy new uniforms for the air stewardesses? Are you going to pay the loan off on that plane? Are you going to buy a new plane? Are you going to invest in the innovation fund? Because your innovation director says we're not innovating fast enough. Are we going to, you know, and are we going to hedge on oil, right? And he said throughout the day, they had to make real operational decisions based on real operational data that we'd given them from the airline. And he said the only decision in the day they had to make was to appoint a president. And he said it was hilarious. They all pointed at each other and said, it's you, it's you. (laughs) And no one wanted to be the president. And he said, because they suddenly understood the complexity of the decisions. And they all said, you've got a horrible job. And he said, no, I've got a complex job, right? And he said, but the genius was, you know, he'd be three weeks later, he'd be, you know, in some airline, an airport in, in the US, and, you know, uh, he'd be getting on a plane and an air stewardess would say, you know, Fred, it's all about cash flow. You know, <laughs> he said it was like, you know, yeah. but that was just a great example. And I was telling that story to, you know, some clients recently, and one client just went, oh my God, that is absolutely brilliant, right? You know, I'm not saying I'm going to create a, a, you know, an exact board game like, like, like Fred did, but that principle of how do I provide my frontline people with real operational data? on which I'm going to ask them to make decisions to help them understand the complexity of this business is fantastic. And I just I just don't know if you get that level of insight from, you know, somebody who's in a perhaps more of a kind of academic world. Yeah, I, I totally concur with that on the basis that your MBAs and your academic degrees will give you the information and the foundations of which you can then take decisions and make decisions but it doesn't give you the level of intimacy you've just described, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it is that it is that, and it's that it's what clients love is they like the kind of warts and all approach. You know what I mean? Because right. again, some of the best sessions we've ever done as wavelength is when we've had leaders who frankly are willing to talk with brute honesty about also failure and you know mental health issues and you know insecurities and imposter syndrome and all these things that you know so many leaders in the corporate world frankly do suffer with and challenge with from time to time but people aren't 
willing to talk about them enough. And when, you know, so when when they get a chance to hear a peer open up about how lonely it is as a leader, you know, and their struggles with leadership, um, uh, you know, they they find it really reassuring, um, inspiring, informative, you know, and that's that's a you know, and, and that leaves us feeling good as a business as well. If we help, we can help people who maybe. Uh, you know, struggling with something to to think it through by providing them with some very relevant stimulus from somebody who's been where they've been. Yeah. Imposter syndrome is an interesting one because my experience tells me that people have a perception this is just for junior managers or leaders (laughs) moving from one place to another. Every single leader, without doubt, at one point in time would have suffered from that, right? Oh, unequivocally, unequivocally. It is probably the number one unspoken thing, the business leaders, you know. I had a client years ago, uh, and they summarized it brilliantly. They just said, every year, I kind of, I go slightly up the food chain. I get a business card with a bigger sounding, more important job title. I get more people. I get sent to business school to listen to academics who make me feel intellectually inferior. They give me a reading list that I don't, I can't, I'm never going to get through and don't understand. <laughs> uh, and then, and I look in the mirror and I kind of go, it's just me. They're going to understand it's me, right? And my partner looks at me as well and goes, yeah, I know. You're like, let's just keep, and he went, you know, and, it, and someday I'm going to be found out, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it was, and it's so true. It is so true that, you know, uh, all of us, I think, feel that kind of, you know, you're faking it, you know, you're not real. But I think there's great reassurance in the fact that it is unequivocally every single leader, doesn't matter what level of seniority they're operating at, in my experience. And I have had the pleasure of working with some, you know, interviewing, hosting, visiting some incredible leaders around the world. And it is, it's it's just the same. It's the universal truth. And what I've observed about this whole notion of imposter syndrome is actually it isn't imposter syndrome at all. It's just facing new challenges that they haven't yet dealt with. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Which is why learning from leaders who have faced other things and other experiences is the best way to get into the real nitty gritty of how to deal with that and how to respond to it. Yeah. 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 No. So having had the opportunity to work with some of these fantastic organizations, if you had to peel back all of those experiences together what would you say are the couple of attributes that would make a real great leader stand apart i think um one of them is is um i, I think that there's a, a fantastic guy called ed shine who who actually having just talked about um you know the, the role of academics i think there is you know i think he, he is an academic at mit and i think great leaders recognize a truth that he articulated a number of years ago, which is the only thing of real importance that leaders do is to set and define culture. And I think that is, you know, so I think first and foremost, the very best leaders understand that's the most important thing that they do is set and define the culture and really pay attention to that. And if you do that, I think it drives, and you know, you know, in a related world, it was there was a lovely quote from the, the late great um, Herb Gallagher, um, the founder of Southwest Airlines, who once said that I mean, power should be reserved for weightlifting and boats, which I think is you know, <laughs> like it. just a great quote. <laughs> but I think it it talks to you know, unfortunately, quite a lot of leaders don't realise that the most important thing they do is set and define culture and become obsessed by this thing called power, you know, and try and command influenced by job title and 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 you know frankly some uh, some not constructive behaviors where i think great leaders don't do that and so i think you know if you do that then there's a number of things that that i i, I think um that they do so i think um they champion and encourage um is probably you know number one um and, and again i i kept, I'm, uh, there was a a fantastic leader a number of years ago we interviewed. It was a former board director of a, one of the world's most admired companies. And he talked about everybody, every leader is a CEO. And we said, you know, he said, but not in the traditional sense. Every leader should be a chief encouragement officer. <laughs> and I just think nice. that's a really lovely mantra, right? It doesn't matter what level of seniority you are, think of your job as a chief encouragement officer. You are a CEO um, in, 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 in that sense. I think another thing is, again, this goes to setting culture. Great leaders are on message. 
Um, and what I mean by that is um, it was Terry Kelly, actually, the former chief exec of W. L. Gore and Associates, come behind Gore-Tex, who once said um, a, 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 to a wavelength group, um, she said, you know, if you have director in your job title, you have forfeited the right to complain in public, <laughs> which, again, I just love as a kind of mantra, um, because it's not about saying you can't disagree. Of course, you can have a disagreement or a different point of view to a peer or a colleague, but it's about doing it in the appropriate forum, having those yeah. debates, having those discussions, getting alignment, 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 right? Because if you're the kind of leader that sits in a meeting with your peer group, you know, vehemently pretend to agree with something, and then as soon as you leave, go down the physical corridor, the virtual corridor to the water cooler and immediately undermine everything that's been said and everyone, everyone who said it. Well, what kind of culture are you creating? So I think, you know, um, to the point you talked about a little bit ago about um, imposter syndrome, I think they're self-aware as well. I think really good leaders are self-aware that they, Alan Joe, um, Unilever's chief exec. In fact, I'm doing a um, podcast later this week with Tim Munden, his former chief learning officer. Um, at Unilever, they have a thing which is in a game and out a game which is they have a belief that you, to be a really, really good leader, you have to, first of all, master your inner game. You know, what's your sense of purpose? You know, who do you stand for? What are your values? You know, um, are you, frankly, as comfortable in your skin as you can be? And once you've done that, then there's a chance that you can master your outer game, which is, you know, much more kind of the ability to enroll and engage others and, you know, create a great compelling culture and you know, operational excellence. You know, it's a really interesting way about thinking of leadership. So, I mean, there are, there are lots of other attributes of great leaders, but just in the interest of time, there's probably a, there's a top, top, yeah. top few. The inner game is a really interesting one because it's where self-awareness comes from as well. But also if you cannot master that inner game, then you know, the voice in our head, our virtual coach, our personal coach, call it what you will, is not going to give us the right context, messaging, and mindset to allow us to master our outer game. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as one, and I've done, you know, I, I speaking personally, you know, I'm a, I'm a great advocate, um, great advocate for um, building yourself a real strong network of people that will help you with your inner game, you know, coaches, mentors, you know, uh, whatever you want, clinical psychologists, doesn't matter. You know, like it's, 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 it's lonely out there. It's tough out there. Uh, whether you are, you know, frankly, a large, you know, C-suite executive in the, on the board of a large multinational or whether you are a, uh, you know, a five person starter, you know, SME, you know, it, it's, it's lonely. And, um, surrounding yourself with really smart you know informed people specific expertise that can help you with your inner game i think is invaluable yeah so having had the benefit of working with some really inspirational firms is there one that sets itself apart as being the most inspirational you've worked with i think there's probably uh, uh, there's probably two <laughs> if i may be uh, maybe into them, yeah they beg two for for different reasons so um, the first actually is in India, um, and it is the truly astonishing um, Aravind eye care system in India, which is the largest specialist provider of eye care in the world. And what makes it quite incredible is it was founded nearly 50 years ago by a then 58-year-old retired ophthalmic surgeon in a tier two town in Tamil Nadu in India who, as you do, age 58, in a tier two town in Tamil Nadu province in India, decides the problem of needless blindness, as defined by cataract, requires the solution of scale of McDonald's. So citing McDonald's as his inspiration for their ability to basically execute um, at scale, he decided to create the the, I, the uh, McDonald's of eye care. Um, uh, the, with the, when, and the Aravid eye care system was born with the purpose, which they've never changed to eradicate needless blindness and although they're structured as a non-profit the metrics are insane so they've treated something like 70 million people over the last 50 years they their operational efficiency their 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 productivity is five times greater than any other eye care surgeon in the world so the average 
surgeon at, at Aravind will do five times the number of surgeries than the next best in the world. That drives a quality, which is about 60% better than the next best in the world. It drives a cost control, which is a hundredth of the National Health Service to provide cataract. Um, so you're doing five times the, the level of volume at a hundredth of the cost at 60% better quality. They've never dropped an EBITDA below about 35% in 50 years. They're in partnership now with the applicant with, with Google on the application of AI. So that's all the hard stuff that you think is pretty impressive. But that's all in pursuit of their purpose to eradicate needless blindness. That means that nearly 50% of the people they've treated over 50 years have never paid a dime for the treatment. So you're running a cross-subsidy business model, which enables the if you basically literally you walk up to an Aravind eye care system hospital and you have a choice: turn left, free hospital, turn right, paying hospital. And you may get a potted plant and a you know a nicer meal if you pay, but when you get to the surgery, it's the same surgeon. And they used to make a joke and say it's a bit like flying business class. We don't change out the pilot. Um, so you're getting the same quality as you do if you pay, but nicer frills. Um, you add to that um the fact that so you're making 35% EBITDA and giving away nearly you know 40% of your of your product. Um they have a um they their whole business model to, is to include the excluded. Um, that includes um, the people they employ. So they're about 70% female workforce. They recruit about 1,000 young women a year from rural backgrounds who are typically 16, who they recruit, train, educate to become the secret source of their productivity. They have a university where they've open sourced the models. Another 300 hospitals around the world have, 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 have been taught the Aravind process by Aravind. And if that isn't enough, they've got a manufacturing arm that has about 10% of the world's market for interocular lenses. So <laughs> whatever lens you look at it, excuse the pun, Aravind is truly remarkable, about 5,000 people. Staggering you know, results. Stag- it is absolutely staggering. So if you would ask me about that you know the the power of purpose there is just extraordinary so it's the most purpose that organization in the world meets arguably the finest performing organization in the world in terms of you know productivity quality cost you know ebitda i mean all that stuff that that the hut the private sector cares about to drive a social impact that beggars belief so for for many reasons there they were they are remarkable uh, at, a, at a more sort of you know classically well known case, but I, so don't get me wrong, Aravind have been subject to Harvard and Wharton case studies. I think even INSEAD, so they are known, but I don't think they're known well enough. And um, we've taken groups to India physically twice um, to go. Then we actually had one of their board with us in America last week, so we 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 have a very close relationship with them. And we've even got a series of films about them. But the other one would be would be Southwest Airlines, um, and I just cite them because you know. This is the world's most flown, successful, admired airline. And I think what makes them so remarkable is you have to, first of all, I think, really just understand the context in which any airline operates. You know, but Southwest, well, I was literally there 10 days ago with, with clients, and they said, you know, we put 500,000 human souls a day in aluminium tubes surrounded by jet fuel and fly them at 500 miles an hour. <laughs> and you go, yes, wow. And you've got to do that with a level of operational safety, which, you know, where there's zero tolerance. Right. Add into that a business model, which is about low cost, high frequency, and excellence in service is an incredibly tough <laughs> mix, right? Yeah. Where you've got so many things outside of your control, oil prices, you know, heaven forbid, you know, terrorism, health security, you know, weather, you know, I mean, all the things that can affect the profitability of an airline. So to to operate in that context where they have built a culture of just positively, you know, relentless, compulsive, obsessive focus on people, you're talking, you know, 50, 60,000 people, um, to now go beyond America's borders, to be flying to to Mexico, to Hawaii, to Latin America, as they are now, because they want to, you know, they want to become the world's most flown, most admired airline, as opposed to at the moment they are America's certainly biggest, the biggest domestic carrier in America. And to people at the heart of their business, that the way that they do, that delivers, you know, so their model is kind of, if you put people at the absolute epicenter of your business. And you know, really compulsive, obsessive focus on who you recruit and how you onboard them and how you enliven their spirit. 
there's a decent chance that, that they will then deliver positively outrageous service, or indeed, as they now call it, hospitality to your your guests, your customers. And if you've got great people delivering great service to your clients, there's a reasonable chance you'll make a profit. And that's a model they've proven time and time again to be over 50 years. But again, it comes back down to power of purpose, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, they are. Um, we, you know, I was in America 10 days ago with 20 clients and we began our week together visiting Southwest. And you talk about purpose, but you talk about how to engage people. So this this was, this was um, so imagine, so we were there on a Monday morning when they were onboarding about 500 new um, uh, employees from across the business, ramp agents, flight agents, um, you name it. And um, imagine this was your first day, the first minute of your first day at your new company, because we got as a wavelength group to go and um, line what they called the red carpet. So imagine in the head office, they literally put a red carpet down the middle of it. A shuttle bus pulls up, out gets 80, 100 new employees. They walk in the door and they are immediately greeted by a cacophony of sound being made by about 150 Southwest employees from across the business, whooping, hollering, sounding klaxons, clapping with signs, welcoming them to Southwest Airlines, right? And we got to witness that as a client group. So you think significant emotional engagement, right? right. You know, look at that, right. the principle there. I'm not saying that every company should, should do that for their people, but imagine, and literally these new hires had their phones out and they were looking around them going, oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? They were literally, and literally you've arrived on your first day and you are literally being, you know, welcomed by hundreds of people down a red carpet to the new Southwest Airlines family. And then you go through to a classroom and, you know, and now you're there with, you know, 300 odd people and there's, it's like a celebration of your arrival and within the first literally 15 20 minutes there is a brilliant brilliant video that is voiced by employees across the business that talks about the purpose of southwest airlines you know and 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 its heritage and its values and where it's come from and it was just you know it was magical to witness i bet yeah sounds and feels just you know, emotional connection from the get-go is going to really lay some solid foundations, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like you know, if you contrast that with with the the, the typical onboarding process, if there even is one, <laughs> from from in most you know companies, small or large, and I think particularly in this sort of remote hybrid era where a lot of people are boarding, you know, and being onboarded whilst at home, you know, um, and probably they, they, if they're lucky, they get a, you know, they might get a, you know, some sort of box in the post with a laptop in it and and basically kind of like, you know, <laughs> with an expectation to plug it in and tune into some sort of online tutorial on their first morning, you know, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just, yeah. So I think, you know, the principle there is, how do you having you know and and particularly in the context of this war for talent and the great resignation right you know what could you what can be learned from that that principle of providing you know new hire employees with a fantastically emotional experience that will stay with them probably for the rest of their lives and the rest of their careers yeah definitely so so we're going to turn the tables a little bit so you're a successful leader in your own right as well as having the experience of being surrounded by great leaders and therefore, I want to tap into your leadership brain now. So <laughs> this part of the show, we're going to dive into trying to distill all of those leadership lessons that you've had. What would be your top three leadership hacks, Adrian? Whoa, gosh, well, I've got, well, I've got three. I don't know, I've got three. I think, I think, I think my big um, reflection is um, that the power of networks. And um, what I mean by that is there's a, uh, again, a, a, you know, uh, started off earlier and saying, you know, th- there is absolutely was. I believe in leaders learning from leaders. And I believe in that for vehemently. I also, you know, do do every now and again, tap into and admire some some sort of work of of, of selected kind of, you know, um, consultants or academics. And there's a, a brilliant book, um, which I would advocate called The Personal Boardroom. Um, and what the personal boardroom does is it talks about this point about the power of networks and not networking, because networking is a concept I think that sends most certainly British executives with an immediate, immediate allergic reaction. Yeah. And um, what what I mean by personal boardroom is who are the is, is learning about who are the people 
that that you should have around you that play a very specific role in your career that you can tap into at times of need, in terms of advice, when things are going well, when things aren't going well, when you're feeling low, when you're feeling high, when you're feeling, you know, in, in the middle, you know, who do you who do you call? And and what the personal boardroom book does very brilliantly is it kind of defines specific roles to say ideally and it's i like it as a visual to say right steve imagine you know you turn around in your uh house now and there's a you know dining room table and it's got i don't know eight to ten chairs around it what their research indicates and again it is it's reality based because they interviewed lots of really really successful leaders is that those chairs should be each occupied by somebody playing a very specific role in your career so for example your mentor or a sponsor or a coach or um there's a particular role they love uh, they call the nerve giver which i love which is you know you've been asked to do a major presentation to your chief exec or you know the board you're absolutely panicking you call them up and they say, Steve, you're gorgeous. You've got this, right? <laughs> right. You know, who's that person? <laughs> right? Who is that person in your role? Or they make a very interesting distinction between, you know, a coach who really, I think, tries to, um, you know, ask smart questions of you to help you figure out the answer. A mentor who I think, frankly, is the sort of person you ring up and just says, do this because they've they've probably been there and done it and they're just much more directive in their advice um and then there's a you know kind of a sponsor who actually is the person who's in the room when the decision about you is being made right who's talking about you to the people mm. that you need to be you know so I, I my sort of leadership hack would be about really thinking about do you have a personal boardroom and because and what i mean here is this is this is not colleagues who sit alongside you every day it, it is extremely it, 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 i think you know I, i'm sure there are some some people inside your but i think most leaders operate in an echo chamber yeah where they are talking to people just like them in industries just like them or indeed inside their own organization and they don't have that benefit of external um validation inspiration nerve give you know like you know and i've and i've so i think my Maybe that's more than one hack. I know it rolled into one, but I think that my sort of number one would be around that. But I think a line to that w- would be around this, and I've, I've touched upon it a couple of times, is, is, is that do not be afraid to ask for professional support and help from, you know, a coach's coach can be brilliant. And I'm a massive advocate of coaches, someone you can talk to external to your organization about what's keeping you awake at night or where do you want to go with your career? What's your next play or whatever it is that's, you know, whatever your your, your hopes or your fears are, or whatever it is, somebody who you can you can ask really smart questions of you and help you think things through and catastrophize if you need to, but in a safe space. I'm I'm world class at catastrophization. So I've used coaches in that in that capacity. Or, you know, if you need even more help, if you need to, you know, I've lost my father tragically very suddenly to a heart attack five years ago you know and i even undertake some grief grief counseling for a while to get myself back on the straight and narrow i've even worked with a, a clinical psychologist at one point where i just was just not in a in a in a productive good space and uh you know uh, she helped me really sort of you know understand that and talk about maybe some structures and systems and processes to address that and you know so i think my second sort of one i think would be would be that would be, yeah is around that is that is the is the power of of specialists to really help you in your career and in and frankly in your life yeah awesome really really helpful uh, t- uh, hacks and tips thanks Adrian next part of the show we call it hack to attack so this is typically where something hasn't gone well it might mm. have been quite catastrophic but as a result of the activity you've taken some learning from it and it's now a force of good in your life and work what would be your hack to attack. <laughs> Well, I mean, in 2020, we lost 60% of our revenues in six weeks um, because my business was based on, you know, physical immersions. So you can imagine uh, imagine that um, it was it was somewhat um, uh, catastrophic to your kind of emotional state. Um, uh, uh, but again, I, I'm sounding like a broken broken record. But I, I, you know, I remember what happened was I was ringing up people in my network. Um, frankly, you know, 
very deflated, <laughs> very, uh, you know, down. And I was just, you couldn't figure out what the answer was to the problem we were facing. And um, it was, you know, and we were toying with, so we've always had this a program called Connect that's been at the heart of our business. And 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 um, fortunately, we, we found a way to keep that program going. We managed to execute it uh, in a sort of slightly hybrid physical digital way, but we were trying to, turn up the digital element of the connect program to see whether we could add some more you know clients into the mix and it was a client who i've worked, should now become a friend who i've worked with years and just said for god's sake adrian separate the two things out you have amazing access to amazing content leaders have never been more isolated than they have right now there's never going to be a need to for what you can win them which is that inspiration that education that provocation create a digital only model it will reduce your price point it'll make your business more accessible and i literally came off that call i got a piece of paper and i scoped out on a piece of paper um and she said you know call it something like inspire and i went right brilliant idea <laughs> i literally sat down and that was the genesis of um of, of the of the wavelength inspire program which we launched in january 2021 um and it has been the absolute best thing we've ever done. Uh, we have now 650, 700 people subscribed to it from all around the world. It's made our brand far more accessible. Um, it has enabled clients to bring the outside world in its scale. You know, previously we only had to, you know, could only send one or, you know, two, three, four, five people on our programs. Typically now they can send, you know, I've got one client with 150 people signed up to it. So that's, that's fantastic. And, and so, and it's taken us into, incredibly new and exciting places we've run run sessions from south africa from uh, silicon valley from china from because it's digital you can also you know you can access the content in a different way so i think um what was that so the and i think yeah you can't sit still i suppose steve yeah. was the thing from that was you you know you cannot you know yes sometimes you have to feel deflated you have to lick your wounds you have to kind of like you know when we we made some you know it was, it was a very tough time but ultimately you have to kind of Pick yourself, and I had no idea, no idea when I did come off that call and I did that one pager that it would, you know, I, I, I said, like, if we tell 100 places, I'll be happy. And we sold 300 in the first go, and now we're at 700. And I just, um, you know, you have to kind of, in order to get going, get going. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Keep moving forward, you know, keep trying stuff. Definitely. Now, the very last thing we get to do is you get to do some time travel, bump into Adrian at 21 and give him some advice. What would it be? It's a really tough question to ask because I I'm pretty happy with the decisions I've made in my career. I think probably I think the one thing would I would have done would have would have been um, to have got more help earlier in my career around some of things that that I you know, can, can, can like all of us we can display perhaps not brilliantly optimal behaviour sometimes and I think. I, you know, in my sort of late twenties, early thirties, you know, you know, there's a, there's a, I'm driven by, you know, a passion and a belief, and you know, I'm an energetic person, and I love, you know, and that has some very positive attributes. Sometimes it, it, it not so positive, and I, I was too late, I think, in realizing that I can't just rationalize my way out of what was going on <laughs> myself, yeah. and actually the need to just stop, talk to somebody with real professional expertise to help me understand what was driving those behaviors and to direct them in a more productive way. So I think I would have um, told my 21 year old self, you know, don't be, you know, I think you kind of think it's either a combination of you feel like you know it all, or actually it's a sign of weakness <laughs> asking for help and support and um, don't be stupid. It's a sign of neither. Super advice, something that we perhaps don't even find out about until later on in life when actually, you know, like you said, calling on that early would have been really helpful. Love yeah, it. absolutely. So the very last thing we want to do today is make sure our listeners can connect with you. So yeah. how is the best way we can do that? A uh, number of ways. So uh, uh, obviously the we're a great website, uh, wavelengthleadership.com. Uh, um, follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, also be, be great as well. Very active on, on LinkedIn. Um, do also do a little bit of Twittering, not so much on Twitter, but certainly very active on LinkedIn um, uh, uh, and the website. Also, you know, we like, yeah, I'm, I'm featured on various podcasts. We host our own, own little series called Making Waves, where I also get a chance like you, Steve, to interview some 
you know, really, really interesting people, um, or just ping me an email at adrian at wavelengthleadership.com. And uh, yeah, I would love to love to uh, field any follow-up questions or uh, uh, any areas of interest anyone's interested to uh, to discuss further. We'll drop those into the show notes as well. So literally people can finish listening, click and uh, connect with you. I just want to say thank you. It's been really lovely chatting. You've got such an enormous network that is now allowing us to learn from that and leaders learn best from leaders. So thanks for being on our podcast. Thank you, Steve. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Adrian. I want to sign off by saying a thank you to you for joining us on the show too. We recognize without you, there is no show. So please continue to share, subscribe and like and continue to get in touch with us with the great news stories that we share every week. And so that we can continue to bring you great stories, please make sure you give us a five-star review where you can and share this podcast with your friends, your teams, and your communities. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, at Leadership Hacker, Leadership Hacker on YouTube, and on Instagram, the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And if that wasn't enough, you can also find us on our website, leadership-hacker.com tune into next episode to find out what great hacks and stories are coming your way that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been your leadership hacker